We got one more Bloomberg clip, and then we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to that one. Uh, one more Bloomberg clip to just round out his multi-dimensional problems that he has as a candidate. We have gone through his conflict of interest with China and his inability to uh, respond truthfully about China because of all his holdings there. That's where his billionaire status becomes a conflict. We've seen that, obviously, with Donald Trump. We went through his being an oligarch, where he basically admits and then quickly changes his um, uh, the words he's using, that he's bought a bunch of Congress people. We've gone through the point where he has shown an incredible disdain for women, even in the context of claiming that he didn't show any disdain for women. Uh, he did shows disdain for a woman bringing it up again. Um, <laughs> There's no pleasing these people. There's no pleasing the ladies. I thought, do you guys have the same hormones Give going me, on? give me, give sense. me. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, we showed his inability to actually be a campaigner and, you know, even deliver a, a some self-effacing joke. Well, here is uh, Mike Bloomberg. And they've actually cut this clip as a way of showing that he has sensitivity to the experience of African-Americans in this country. Woke and, Bloomberg. Yeah, he's totally woke. Woke um, is But not the one good. thing that Michael Bloomberg cannot possibly imagine is that his billions of dollars weren't a function of him right that his position and station in life that there were no you know the doors that were not shut on him because of just how he was positioned they don't exist and it take, takes all the effort he can muster to concede that maybe things are a little bit more difficult or would have been difficult had he been black. Oh, wait a second. I know that if I were black, my success would have been a lot harder to achieve. And I know a lot of black people that if they were white, it would have been a lot easier for them. That's just a fact, and we've got to do something about it than rather just demagogue about it. I love how he says, like, he gets his big, the big concession he has is that I understand my success would have been harder to achieve. I would have been the owner of BT if I was black. I mean, the, the idea, the, 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 just statistically speaking, the chances of becoming a billionaire if Michael Bloomberg ha was particularly his age, um... Could someone do a version of Black Like Me starring Mayor Bloomberg? I think that would be excellent. And making his money on Wall Street uh, services, I think, is highly, highly uh, dubious. He also lied about what his positions were on Redline and earlier, and he continued his lie about uh, what his position on Stop and Frisk is. At which he will continue to do. And this, again, I, I will plug Adolf Reed, though. This is a big part of his critique of all of these discursive methodologies, because they basically are like, look, if you can be trained to check your privilege or whatever else, all this other rhetorical maneuvering, you can use that to barrel forward with the same uh, policy set. And that's exactly what he's yeah, doing we, while he lies about we that. We saw it from a lot of Yeah, that's what they're all doing night, because it's just a discursive the most egregious. Of course, example. because it's just a discursive, you know, it's just a discursive method. Do it's we want to go into the stop and frisk line now? Have I have it. Sure, yet? let's do that as long as we're doing our, our, our Bloomberg uh, swing. Here is uh, Michael Bloomberg. He's, he's talking about uh, stop and frisk, claiming that this is done in so much in the passive voice, right? Which is like, it was there and then it metastasized. It got out of hand. Oh, it got out of hand. Like something, some, you know, like the, the, the invisible hand of the, of, the, of the police force was driving this. And then when I saw it was getting out of control, I, I tried to control it as much as I could. It was like a, riding a tiger. I want to ask you about a question that impacts the black and brown community. You've apologized for stop and frisk repeatedly. What exactly are you apologizing for? We let it get out of control. And uh, when I realized that, I cut it back by 95%. And I've apologized and asked for forgiveness. I've met with black leaders to try to get an understanding of how I can better position myself and what I should have done and what mm. I should do next time. But let me tell you, I have been working very hard. We've improved the school system for black and brown uh, uh, I got a subscription to Safety Pin Box. And, uh, 
Ari Melber had on the woman who ruled on that. This is the judge who heard the case that stopped Stop and Frisk. And let's hear her perspective. She's now retired. And this was before the debate, by the way. She was responding to the previous time he lied about Retired it. federal judge. Did Mike Bloomberg decide unilaterally, it sounds like, oh, this has gotten out of hand. We better pull this back. I'll say this whether, whether you do or not as a, as a former judge. Mayor Giuliani had a tough policy that was controversial on predominantly black neighborhoods in New York. That's right. And Mayor Bloomberg came in and said, let's make it even harsher to the point that it was ruled by you unconstitutional. That's true. And there was a second half to your question. You said, what did people say last night that was wrong? Well, Mayor Bloomberg said, when I realized it was bad toward the end, I ended it and dropped 95 percent. That is not accurate. In the last two years or so, it began to drop dramatically. It dropped 67 percent, not 95 percent. But it wasn't because he realized, had an epiphany that it was wrong. It's because of the court rulings. That's what happened. Right. I ruled. And Joe Biden said I, I, that the Obama administration stopped it. I thought you stopped yes, it. Was Joe got, Biden correct or not? Of course he's not. You got in just ahead of me. I was going to say that Vice President Biden was totally Lucky I'm wrong not in too. your courtroom. That's right. <laughs> he said that the Obama administration appointed a federal monitor totally wrong. I appointed a federal monitor in August of 2013, who didn't take office for 10 months because Mayor Bloomberg insisted on trying to appeal my ruling and getting it over. So simply put, Joe Biden, in your view, took credit for something that judges actually did. Absolutely. Um, that's what you call, like, um, uh, what is it when the, you, you, um, uh, you get the strike? And even though that's the split, uh, the spare rather, and you got one pin over here and one pin over here, and you just the ball rolls and bounces off of both. I was the guy banging the gavel. That's right. I was the guy who stopped it all. I started with, I mean, Bloomberg, horrible liar, Biden, horrible liar. And we didn't even have time to get into uh, Biden talking about him getting arrested in South Africa or something. I don't even. I was the like, guy who said, "Hey, you got to talk to to him, Becky." I was there, but but I just I want to I want to really keep emphasizing though that the Joe Biden's lies are terrible and they're egregious and they're like Hillary Clinton's lies. They're like there is something qualitatively different we get to in the realm of Bloomberg where he is the personal conduit of authoritarianism. I mean, stop and frisk is, is literally an apartheid style policy. It's not hyperbole. And, it, you know, that's, it's not like a legislative Biden's got pact. that thing of I mean, like where he uh, sort of puts himself in positions that maybe somebody else told him the story. And he's like, yeah, that, that was me right, <laughs> type right. of thing. Like, uh, no, no, versus I. Bloomberg is lying. I am lying about yeah. in, in, a, in a completely verifiable manner, banking on the fact that my money and propaganda will overwhelm yep. people telling the truth. Yeah, he's yep. doing Trump shit. Yep. So there it is. I mean, those are the, uh, what, what was, what was More it? More Six different sort of like elements of Bloomberg that uh, any one of them, I think, would be enough to depress enough Democratic voters uh, in a general election to uh, cause his loss. Um, and that's why, I mean, the fact is, after two debates, literally, I don't know how many, how much time did, did, did Bloomberg speak in those two debates combined? Maybe 25 minutes? Let's just say 25 minutes of exposure Mike Bloomberg gets versus the hours, maybe days, no, probably weeks. And I mean this like continuous loop of 30 second ads probably could have, could amount to like a full week or two or three or even a month. He spent over $350 million on ads and 30 minutes of actually opening his mouth and addressing what's going on has sunk the value of that money. <clears throat> um, I, I think you shouldn't be able to run for office unless you go into a debate, but I don't know how you'd ever make that. How much? 26 minutes. Somebody's got to count I mean, up how things. much the ad time that he bought and, and sort of calculate. Like, it's amazing. It's amazing what happens. And this is... This is a very, very positive thing, not just for the Democratic Party, um, not just for America, but for, for democracy 
across the world on some level because it shows that there is a limitation to what you can do with money. Now, he's a particularly egregious guy who, um, you know, but there is the, the irony is, is that his superpower, right, which is has sixty five billion dollars is also is his kryptonite. Because he has bit that sixty-five billion dollars has kept him in such a cocoon that he has absolutely no ability to understand why he is such a liability. Yeah, I like. I mean, call me naive, but I really thought someone with that much money would be able to afford like the best coaches in the world and the best like brand. But you need to know that you have a problem. And the problem with that money is that everyone around you does it says like you got no problems, boss. Yeah. That's, You're gonna save America. It's, that's that's ninety percent of it, and I think ten percent of it is is like, I think these debates are when you watch an NBA game, you know that you can't do that. When you watch this, especially if you do what we do, we're like, come on, I can figure that out, yeah. and you don't realize that e all of these people. This is a really intense process. Right. And I, I, you know, he's coming in with a typical arrogance and it's like, especially when you're completely out of touch, billionaire oligarch, but you also haven't campaigned for over a decade. OK. Yeah. The last 10 years, all you've been doing is going to Davos and sitting with Fareed Zakaria and being like, how would you change public yeah. education, Mayor Bloomberg? Right. And all of a sudden. Elizabeth Warren's in your face and Bernie Sanders is in your face. And the moderators have to at least pretend to ask you about your any number of abominable positions. You're totally not ready. And you can't be. I mean, he could hire the best coaches in the world. And, you know, look, Trump does. First of all, he's an entertainer, first and foremost. And he weirdly like he has higher emotional intelligence. Like, I don't mean that as a value judgment. Well, it's also but he knows yeah, how to work the room. But it's he also knows how to he has political skills that Bloomberg lacks. That's true. But also remember, like the debates, like the, the advantage sorry. that Trump had in the debates was he would say, like, I'm going to build a wall. And then Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio would come in. Well, I'm going to build a wall that's two feet higher. Right. <laughs> like that was, there was nobody. There was nothing that he was saying here's the that difference. was really fundamentally different from, you know, regardless of whether you think the Democratic Party uh, upholds these principles, everything that we're talking about are theoretically principles of the the Democratic Party. I'm also talking like instincts. Like, I don't know how the... I, well, look, we know that you had to pay a huge amount of money to be in that audience, okay? So even if Bloomberg had nothing else to do with it, apparently the tickets to get into that room, if I'm reading Lee Fong correctly... I mean, tell me whether or not that's right. I read that I've last heard, I've heard that that has been the case in, in, in most of these right. things, but it does feel like they... It feels like the room is pretty nice yeah. to Bloomberg. Yep. There was an amazing clip going around last night of Trump getting booed vigorously at a Republican oh, yeah. debate and Trump doing, frankly, what Bernie maybe should do at a certain point of being like, you know, looks like the room's stacked against me, but sorry, folks, telling the truth. Right. That's the difference. Right. Bloomberg is paying for the room to be stacked in the large metaphorical sense. Trump had no problem going out there and, and working right. the broader electorate. And which is another reason that people coming out with this scam that Bloomberg could beat Trump are the most just either delusional or dishonest people in the entirety of politics right now. Or, or. Really well compensated. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> I, Good I, employees. <laughs> I'm hearing so good many, employees. Some of these anecdotes have to be real, but like, like I saw a tweet the other day. A woman said a, a canvasser came to her house. She said, "Sorry, we're a Bernie household." The canvasser said, "Oh yeah, me too. Absolutely. Have a good one." How much do you think? How much do you think the team that came up with these hats made, like total, on just come up, coming up with the design for this? Not a socialist and bringing the bus. Hey, I've got an idea. How about a little flag in the uh, in the, the tag? Yeah. The I respect the hustle. Let's see how well these huh? take off, Mike. Oh, do they all of them? Oh, yeah, they all have little flags. Not a socialist. Bring in the boss. That is just like... I mean... Because we all know how much Americans love their bosses. <laughs> Did you bother focus grouping this? They couldn't have. Like, who in their right mind would broadcast their love of bootlicking to the world on a hat? They're gonna, they, they said to Bloomberg, this is a message directly to Trump. You're his boss. 
And he's like, I love it. I love it. How much are the hats? $75 a hat. Wow, that seems normal. Okay. <laughs> so no, no, no more expensive than a gallon of milk. <laughs> right, exactly. Just a banana, Michael. How much could it cost? Am $5? I really getting, I can't believe how cheap this is. <laughs> You guys, are the, dollars you guys, were, I knew I should have gone with you guys. You were right. You could get the best deals. And Americans are out here complaining about costs and you could get a basic ball cap for $75. What a bunch of whiners. Unbelievable. The only boss I want to bring in is Bruce Springsteen, who, by the way, needs to endorse Bernie.